Jesus sets you free. You are what? Free. free indeed. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. 
Indeed, Jesus is good. Good morning. Welcome to Misty Creek Community Church. My name is Stephen Street. I'm the senior pastor here. If this is your first time with us, we're glad to have you here. If you're joining us with us online, good morning to you as well. If you're on campus today and this is your first time, I hope you'll visit our guest services with Miss Lolly right back there and receive your first time gift from the church. In your seats this morning, you may have noticed you have a little hand out here. Um, there's some announcements on there, and before we get to those, if there are any kids you've not already gone to Creek Kids with Miss Molly, we want to dismiss you at this time. It looks like most have already gone, if not all. Good. All right. Great. So a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. First of all, uh, we have a mission trip planned this summer. It's a, it's a church-wide mission trip, so all, all ages, um, middle schools, the real adults are invited. And uh, the deadline to register for that was actually today. So if you're interested in doing that mission trip, we have um, cards in the back you can pick up. They have a QR code on them, and you can register. At least get your name in that um, that that list to be on that trip with us. We hope you'll think about that. Also, um, if you're interested in learning more about Misty Creek and becoming a member of this worshiping community, Next Steps is a class that we do about every other month, and we have our upcoming Next Steps next Sunday in the basement immediately following the worship service. So I hope you'll be there if you are interested in learning more about the church. And our Holy Week and Easter schedule, I know you may think this is really early. Not really. Um, we got that published for you to take a look at that. And I did want to announce that on Good Friday, on that Good Friday, we're actually going to be watching um, the, the movie, The Passion of Christ. And we'll be watching that on a giant screen in here. And so get that out to the community as well. We want folks to come and be a part of that Good Friday service. Lots of other things going on in the life of the church. I hope you'll take time to look at those. I do have a correction in our little insert today. It says that Youth Alpha is not meeting. That is incorrect. Youth Alpha is going bowling today. The youth group will be bowling. So, and uh, they're going to be having pizza. Don't you wish you were a youth again? Yes. So they will be doing that today from 4 to 6. And just wanted to make that correction in the insert. All right. God bless you. Good morning, church. How are you? The joy of the Lord is in this place, yes? Can you feel it? Amen. We love you, Jesus. You know, our hearts are prone to wander from the Lord. Did you know that? Have you realized that sometimes in your walk? May we remind our hearts and our souls this day and every day that the Lord is good. May we learn to follow his ways step by step. Give us teachable hearts and teachable spirits, Lord. Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, Help us, as the writer of Proverbs wrote, to trust in the Lord with all our heart, to lean not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways to acknowledge him, to acknowledge you, Jesus. And if, and if we do that, you make us a promise, God. If we trust in you and submit to you and lean on your wisdom and your understanding, then you've promised us you will make our path straight every step of the way, even through the trials and the tribulations and the hardships. Lord, you promise that you'll always be by our side, that we should cast our cares upon you, Lord, because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So help us when we lose sight of that, remind us that you're for us, not against us, Lord. 
And so we're going to just worship you now. We're going to pour out our hearts to you, Lord. Lead us and guide us every step of the way. In Jesus' name. Make this our prayer, church. Oh, God, you are my God. And I...
accomplish your will through us and in us, Lord. We love you and we trust you. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? The context here is Paul reminding the Galatian church about freedom in Christ. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Please be seated. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, creator of the universe, all praise, honor, and glory we give to you and you alone. We come before you with gratitude for who you are and your son Jesus who died for us and your Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. We thank you for the freedom we have to gather in worship and proclaim your name loudly without fear. Thank you for our church, the faithfulness of our pastors and leadership teams. You made us spiritual beings, yet gave us bodies of flesh, and we thank you for the beautiful world you created for us to steward and live in. Thank you for the reminders of your goodness all around us as we see signs of spring everywhere. We confess now all the ways that we wander away from you and withhold part of our hearts from you. Forgive us when we focus on being successful at our lives in the flesh while giving less attention to growing in the spirit. We acknowledge that growing closer to you doesn't happen by accident. You gave us free will to choose to follow you or not. Even when it was evident, we would at times choose to sin, sometimes willfully. If our email was taken over by a spam bot, we would shut it down immediately. Yet when our life is controlled by the flesh, our sin nature, we do not act with that same urgency. Forgive us for our selfishness when we insist on our own way exhibit impatience, speak unkindly, or lack compassion for those you place in our path. Slow us down, Lord. Lead us to become more merciful and kind, putting others before ourselves. Let us speak life to others. You declared us new creations and temples of the Holy Spirit when we accepted Jesus as Savior. So we say, not our will, but your will be done. We choose today to be controlled by the Holy Spirit and not by our old selves. We lift up to you now the names on our hearts of those we know that are not walking with you, Lord. Help us to become more like Jesus so they may want what we have. And there are so many in our church and our community that are suffering illness and injury. We pray that you would heal disease and relieve pain according to your will. We ask that you comfort and surround those who are grieving, those who are caring for relatives, or separated from loved ones. You tell us when we fix our eyes on you, anxiety and worries will be replaced with your peace. We ask for a move of God in each heart and especially in our elected leaders. We pray your name to be holy again in our nation and all across the culture. Individually, we cannot fix it all, but you did not call us to carry every burden. There's so much evil in this world that would cause, could cause us to spare but we declare our hope is in you. In Psalms, you tell us not to fret over evil and wickedness, but to be still before you and wait patiently and pray, for their power will be broken, but you will uphold the righteous. Lead us to serve where we can encourage one heart, breathe your hope into one situation. Draw us closer to you this Lenten season. We give you all of our praise. May all we do as individuals and as your church bring honor to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. When I lose my way and I forget my name
If anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen. Can you have a seat? Amen. Isn't it wonderful to be a new creation in Christ? The old self is gone and the new you is here, bursting forth. I want to welcome back uh, to church today. Our own Cassidy. Cassidy's in our youth group. She's a senior in high school, and she just got back from her mission trip to Guatemala. So we're glad you're here. Yes. And speaking of our, our, our youth, um, I want you to be praying for them, not just because they're going bowling today, but I want you to pray for them as next week they're going to be leaving on Friday, and they'll be going to Greenwood, South Carolina for the RISE Youth Conference. I like to say that it's a mini passion event, and it really is wonderful for, for middle schoolers and high schoolers and young adults, and we'll be going next Friday uh, through Saturday. Well, it's an overnighter, so be praying for our group as we'll be gathering with probably around 300 or so other teenagers for a wonderful conference for the youth and young adults there. Um, I also want you to be praying for Doug and I, uh, your pastors. We'll be leaving on Tuesday to go to the Ridgecrest Conference Center in Black Mountain, North Carolina for the New Room Leaders Conference, and we're looking forward to that. There's a, a worship pastor's um, track that Doug's going to be taking, and I have a, a pastor's track that I'll be taking, but we get to be there together. It's the first time we've done anything like that together, so be praying for us and all the leaders that will be going to that amazing conference. And I also want to let you know about the artwork. If you've not already noticed, uh, we have some artwork here. Um, this uh, depicts Christ and the cross. And the explanation of this artwork is right outside in the gathering area as you leave to your right if you want to read about this artwork. And let me tell you about the artist. The artist is Preston Shirley. I'm Preston Shirley, he's a graduate of UGA. He's now a dentist, and he has a family. But I was Preston's youth minister from the time he was in sixth grade until he graduated high school and continued to stay with him. And he does these phenomenal works of art. And this is just a sample of what he does. And um, he's lent us these beautiful paintings uh, for us to enjoy and to reflect on um, during this Lent season. And we're in the second Sunday of Lent, if you didn't already know that. And if you've not picked up your Lent resources from the church, we have a Lent devotion book you can pick up as you leave from Miss Lolly at the welcome desk. We also have Link, uh, Lent, not Link, Lent bingo that you might want to take with you as well. So we've got a couple of things for you to be doing over this season of Lent. And last but not least, uh, yesterday we had a visioning retreat here at the church. I think we had around 60 folks come, and it was a wonderful day of, of worship and fellowship and visioning. And you'll get a, a report of that in the next few weeks of what trying to transpired at the visioning retreat. So we'll give you an update on that very soon. Now I want us to do a little bit of fill in the blank. We're, we're beginning a new sermon series. Uh, for four weeks I've been preaching on Follow the Healer. And the church is also doing the Bible study, Follow the Healer. I think the women have one more week, maybe two more weeks. How many weeks? A couple of weeks left. The leader doesn't even know. I'm just kidding, Sally. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so like somebody the other day, they said, Pastor, you didn't know I was in the hospital? I said, no one told me. I, she said, I thought pastors read minds. I said, I'm good, but I'm not that good. Um, but anyway, um, and the men have a couple of more weeks, because the men do have their session six tomorrow night. And uh, so men, if you've not been to that Bible study yet, we would love for you to join us. Even though we're in week six, you can pick right back up 
with what we're doing. And, and ladies, I feel like you could do that as well if you've missed or not been a part of that study yet. And there are new women's Bible studies that will be starting up in March, and we'll get information out to you for that. And men, there will be Bible studies for you as well um, after we finish up the Follow the Healer series. So I'm in a new sermon series now. It's called The Journey That Leads to Life, Death, and Resurrection. And you actually have notes in your seats this morning. You've got fill in the blanks. If you don't do that during the service, that's your homework for this afternoon. I'm not going to check your homework, but you do have that to take home with you. But I want us to have a little fun first. We're going to do some fill in the blanks. Now, if you are a really, really young person, you may not know any answers to what I'm getting ready to ask, so, but maybe you will. Fill in the blanks. Wheaties is the breakfast of? Yes, you got it. The breakfast of champions. Okay. Nike tells us to just? Okay, I figured you'd get that one. Okay. KFC describes their food as finger licking? Oh, man. Burger King says have it? Yes. Some of you may be those uh, Burger King theologian. Have it your way. And uh, did you pick, pick up on that? Have it your way. And yesterday at the vision retreat, we were talking about that. Let's not vision so that everything that we do is for us. Have it your way. Well, this is what I'd like the church to be or what I want or whatever. But let's instead be Christ visionaries. What does God desire for Misty Creek? What is his vision? Proverbs tell us, tells us without wisdom or vision, we will perish. Without vision, we will perish. And we need to have his eyes and follow him. And this whole series we're going to do is having a Jesus-shaped life, being less like me and more like Jesus, okay? Okay. So the reason we, we did those fill-in-the-blanks is because you and I both know that companies today put a lot of money into advertising. And so we know a lot of phrases, don't we, because of the advertisements out there. We see thousands of ads a day, and they work. We know those little jingles, right? We are Farmers, dun, 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 dun. we know I got all these little jingles, and you may say, "I don't watch any TV, I don't listen to anything," but you still know the jingles. So you're doing something, okay? You're swiping and scrolling at some point of the day, somehow. So whether we know it or not, those ads can change our spending habits. They really can. Whether we know it or not, we're being influenced by forces that shape the way we think, what we value and how we relate to other people. If we're very in touch and in tune with the culture, then the culture is preaching to us, and it will shape our values and what we think and how we spend our money. It's true, folks. If we're in touch and focused on Christ, and we're in His Word, and we're involved in our church, in a small group, in a Bible study, a youth group, whatever the age-level ministry is that you're involved in, that, that's going to shape your values and who you are more than the culture will. You see, our friends, their opinions influence us. You know it's true. You want to know what they think. You run things by them. If your parents are still living, you run things by them, don't you? If you're married, you run things by your spouse. Every Sunday after church, I'll ask Karen, how do you think things went today? She's probably tired of hearing that. I doubt Doug ever asked Sherry anything like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing over there. <laughs> you know, we, we confide in those who are close to us, and their opinion influences us, doesn't it? Yes, I still talk to my mom and dad, and I praise God that I still have them. If you still have them, make sure you're calling them and contacting them, even if you're estranged from them, folks, because you won't always have them with you. Okay? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yes. So I talk to my dad. I ask him for advice and wisdom. I talk to my mama, my mother-in-law. She's in the mansions. Okay, she's assisted living. But I value what she thinks. She thinks that I look just like Ken Jennings. Anybody watch Jeopardy? <laughs> Karen says that's not true. You're better looking. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Jacob over here thinks I look like Mark Price for the Georgia Tech fans in here. You know, it's not true, but I do shoot better than he does. That's a lie, okay? <laughs> he played in the NBA, so there you go. So neuroscientists say using the Internet changes the way that our brains are structured. 
Okay? Do any of you get alerts on your phone that say your screen time was up? That's an alert. Now, I rejoice when it says your screen time was down. I'm like, yes, thank you, God. I'm separating myself from this addictive device that I have in my hand. Okay? So it influences. The Internet influences the way we think. You don't think that's true? Okay, we don't have to really think anymore. If we want to know something, we just look it up real quick. We, we don't have to really know how to subtract and add and divide and multiply and all that anymore. I mean, we should know how to do that, but why should we? Because we can just use our phone or device or whatever to calculate that. You go to a restaurant nowadays, and on the receipt, it'll tell you how much to tip. Do you do it? Okay? So it's worked out for you. Do you know, I don't think, in school today that they're even teaching how to write in cursive anymore. I mean, so they don't know how to sign their names. Or it's just a little scribble, scribble, scrabble, you know? So the Internet, social media, all of that is changing the way our brains are structured and how we live. Cell phones, social media, you know this is true. It changes the way we relate to each other. Okay, if we're always swiping and scrolling and looking down, we're not looking up. You know, isn't it a shame that when you're trying to have a conversation with a friend and maybe you're sharing your heart and if their phone goes off, all of a sudden it's like you're not even in the room. Whatever's on that phone is more important to you at that moment. Isn't that interesting? And that we feel like that when we're starting a text or something and we're having a conversation that we have to put them off until we finish it. Can't you just wait a couple of minutes to send that? You can still send it like five minutes from now. You know, we're so attached to it. It's affected our relationships, our intimacy, being together. I'm so thankful that Misty Creek has not completely fallen into that trap because the church statistics say that church attendance will never return to what it was because of COVID. That's not the only reason. Uh, Entertainment You know, uh, technology, all that's replaced a lot of in-person gatherings across the board. But if you'll notice, we weren't meeting in person for a little while, but not a long, long time. And when we started opening the doors back, of course, we kept worshiping outside for a while. When we opened the doors back, most everybody returned, if not everybody. And we grew during that time because you understood the importance of being together, worshiping together. The author of Hebrews says, do not let us give up on worshiping together. It's important to be together in fellowship, looking at each other, embracing each other. One of the top things we learned at the Vision and Retreat yesterday was why people like Misty Creek, a lot of folks said across the board, they felt loved, they felt valued, the hospitality... They weren't just a number. There was even a term used, there's not so many holy huddles. Do you know what holy huddles are? Come on, you know what those are. You've been in the churches, there's people, a few people gathered around in a little huddle, and you're walking around hoping that somebody will speak to you looking, but they've got their huddles going on. Like in a football game, they got a huddle, okay? We want to break the holy huddles to where we're seeing each other, that we notice when someone new walks onto this campus. Let me ask you a question. Can you tell me who the greeters are here at Misty Creek? Pete? Everybody. Everybody. Now, there's somebody sitting here saying, no, that lolly lady is the, she's, <laughs> and Harlan. No, when somebody new walks on the campus of this church, I take them to lolly or Harlan to say, this is our greeter. You know, what? You know, you are all greeters. And I know it's tough to get to that point because you're thinking, don't I have to have a 12-week training how to be a greeter? Last church I served at, I got a badge. I got a certificate for being a greeter. No, we're not going to go through all of that. We're going to teach you and train you how to be a greeter in the service, okay? To welcome all, to love all, you know? Yes, yes. And how about minister? Everybody thinks, oh, I'd like to meet your minister. He's like, well, let me go find Doug. Let me go find Stephen. We're your pastors. You're the ministers. You're the body of Christ. It's, it's very evident that you, you are a part of the royal priesthood of all believers, a royal priesthood, okay? Now, you may not have been to seminary and have all this training, but God will give you all that you need if you lean into him and depend on him and serve him 
and have that Jesus-shaped life that I'm going to be preaching about. You know, and you're going to notice here at Misty Creek, if you're visiting with us for the first time, that every single message preached here, whether it's Doug or myself or someone else that's speaking, our amazing Sunday school teacher, Jeff Willis, is always going to bring us to Jesus, always going to take us to Jesus. There will be no, no Bible study or sermon or prayer group that doesn't lead us to Jesus because we desire to be more like Jesus, okay? So... Even though we got all these other influences, the culture, the internet, all that stuff, advertisements and all that, if you're a follower of Jesus, there is another force at work in your life. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's shaping you into the image of Jesus. And that's God's plan for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 begins, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, there's one of those words that you say, uh-oh. There's code language in the church, sanctified. One week he preached on justified. What does that mean? I'm going to give you the definition, and you don't have to take a class or read a long book about this. I did. I took a whole semester in cemetery. (laughs) In cemetery, we bring the dead to life. Okay. In, in, In seminary on sanctification. I was bored out of my mind. The projects I had to do, the papers I had to write. And Jesus said, I'm glad you learned all that, and that's good. But let me tell you what it means. To be sanctified means to be holy. To be holy is to be more like me. Jesus says to be like me. That's that's to be holy. You can't make yourself holy. Only God can do that. You can't write your own story. Well, you can, but it will have a tragic ending. Let me write your story. Let's co-author your story together. He defines who you are. He created you in his image. He defines you as male or female. That's his design for you. He makes it very clear. We make it very complicated, and we make it confusing. There's nothing confusing about God's word. He's very clear, okay? So if you're confused or you're struggling, most likely you're not in touch and in tune with the Holy Spirit through God's word. You don't have a relationship Maybe you're practicing religion, which is going through the motions without a relationship with Christ. We want to be in relationship with Christ and the body of Christ. This community of faith is doing that in a beautiful way. But we've got to get beyond these doors and get out of this community, get out into our neighborhoods. Steve Alvarez at the great, and, and Kay, they're great examples of that. They started inviting their neighbors, and their neighbors are coming. Hallelujah. Have you invited your neighbors? Do you know your neighbors? Do you know who lives next door to you or down the street or in your cul-de-sac? Do you? Oh, they're waving a certain flag in their yard. I can't visit them. Come on, folks. Come on. You need to know who your neighbors are. You need to love. What did Jesus say? Love them. Okay, well, they don't think like me. They're kind of like my enemies. He says what? Pray for them. Pray for your enemies and love your enemies. If you're not doing that, then... Your life's not going to be shaped like Jesus. You want to be shaped like Jesus, okay? So sanctification, it means we think like Jesus. We relate to others like Jesus did, okay? We're not self-righteous. Instead, we're humble. Jesus was the greatest humble servant that ever lived in this world, folks. Very humble. And he did not leverage being the Son of God as something to be taken advantage of. Look at me. I'm the Savior of the world. He didn't do that. He didn't have all these degrees and accolades and billboards all about him. There was no church that was just associated with him. He made the kingdom relatable and accessible to all of us, no matter who we are and where we come from. We relate to others like Jesus did. We take time for others no matter how busy we are. We Look up instead of always looking down to see where the needs are. Don't let the culture lie to you that whatever's on your device is more important than the people that are right in front of you. Don't let them do it. It will lie to you, folks. AI is something that's very dangerous. As amazing as it is, and my nephew works in AI in a positive way in the medical field, be careful with AI, folks. I'm just, I'm just telling you. We can know, after being holy... We can know the Heavenly Father like Jesus. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of relationship, the kind of relationship Jesus had with his Heavenly Father? You can when you're sanctified. Don't let that word scare you. Remember, just being like Jesus, holy, 
being like Jesus, okay? Don't let that word I threw out there a while ago, theology, fool you. It just means your relationship with God, my understanding of who God is in my own life. It's when you decide to make a decision to be a Christian, not based on grandmama or granddaddy or your uncle or the pastor, but you make a personal decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This is my decision that I make personally myself to be more like him. And when we are holy, we obey the Father like Jesus. It's all about obedience. And when we're holy, God will give us the power to fulfill his will for us. We're learning that in the Follow the Healer series, and I'm not still preaching on that series, but that's in me, folks, and I know it's in a lot of you. Your perspective on healing is absolutely transformed, hasn't it? Oh, I'm, so God, I'm so glad God is transforming our hearts and our minds according to his word and his will and his ways. And he'll give us the power to fulfill his will for us when we become more like Jesus. He won't just sit back and watch us struggle. He will empower us to grow. That's what this 40-day Lent journey is all about. It's not about giving up ice cream because you know I can't do it. It's not about giving up Diet Coke or whatever it is. It's about sacrifice, but it's more about transformation. How will I lean more into Jesus and learn more from Jesus? How will I just be still and know that he's God and be in his presence? And I don't have to listen to 50 podcasts or read 12 books to do that. I just want to be with him, be in his presence, be near him. That guide that we're giving you for free, I made 100 copies, and there's still like 88 of them. Why haven't you gotten one? I'm not fussing at you. I'm just like, there is something free for you to take home, a prayer guide and about four scriptures, that if you will do that in silence with no distractions, wait on the Lord and what he'll do for you just giving him that few minutes. It will set a pattern that will be with you the rest of your life. You'll see how important it is to feed and drink on the food and drink of the Holy Spirit. It will, it will transform you, that intimacy you will have with him. But you know, there's this three-letter word that gets in the way of everything, sin. Sometimes sin gets in the way of following Jesus. Do you want to know something? Jesus saves us from the penalty and the power of sin. There's a popular bumper sticker that reads, you've probably seen it, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. I've seen that before. That's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. This implies Christians and not yet Christians might live the same way, except the believer will be forgiven by God. That's not what the Bible says. Listen, Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Ah, there it is. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see, followers of Jesus used to be ruled by sin. That is, we did what it said. Something inside of us said, envy, and we would do it. But now we're no longer slaves to sin. We don't have to obey its orders. Sin might say, lie, but we say, no, I'm not going to do it. There is no sin that God cannot free you from. No sin that God cannot free you from. I want you to hear 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I think you'll see it too. It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God saves us from the penalty of sin by forgiving us and from the power of sin by purifying us, changing us, and it leads to transformation, folks. We heard Doug in that song. We are new creations in Christ. The old is gone, the new is come. Beautiful. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Then we go to Romans 12 and it says, Therefore, be no longer conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect.
perfect, pleasing will is for your life. He's not only changing you. He's transforming you. You will never be the same again. He's shaping you into more of him. Nothing like it, folks. You know, we could print some other bumper stickers that say, Christians aren't perfect, just recom- just forgiven and becoming like Jesus. Or we could print another one, just a sinner saved by grace and being changed by grace. I would put transformed by grace. I like that word better, don't you? Even though we've been set free from slavery to sin, Christ-likeness is normal, but not natural. We are victims of of sin, of evil, of the fallen. We might think holy people are born that way, Christ-like. Holy people are born to be holy. Actually, they are born again that way. They're born again that way. When you're born again, you say yes to Jesus. You may say, man, that's an old Baptist term, you know, saved, born again. No, that's relevant today, folks, to be born again New life, resurrection life, is to say yes to Christ and no to sin and evil. And when we come to Christ, we're given a new nature. But our old nature doesn't automatically go away. You know what I mean, don't you? Oh, yes. You may be sitting there thinking, I'm this perfect little angel because I know Jesus and I don't sin and I don't look at anything or do anything. I'm not sure there's anybody in here like that, including your pastor. Okay? And if you are, we would see a halo and you'd be floating. And I don't see anybody. If you think you're that way, you probably have the biggest problem. Okay? So be careful with that. Okay? Humility and surrender. Remember what Christina and Kevin Hermits taught us last week? Humility and surrender, okay? Galatians 5, 16, 17 says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. You're not to do whatever you want. And just think, I can do whatever I want because God's grace is enough and he'll forgive me. I can party it up now. When I'm ready, I can settle down. And then I can live like God's little angel. No. Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, would say that's cheap grace. You're taking advantage of God's goodness and his grace. Christ suffered a horrible death so that you could be forgiven, so that you could overcome sin and not be a slave to sin anymore and not let it take over your life. When you're feeling this tug of war between God's ways and sin's ways, you're feeling the conflict between your your old and your new nature. Don't believe that you're destined to keep tripping over your same sins. Verse 16 says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That means we have to constantly, daily be walking by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Religion is not just on Sunday mornings. And again, religion can be many times Christianity without relationship, without surrender, without forgiveness. We want to surrender. We want to be forgiven. We need it, folks. And it's a daily discipline. It's a daily practice. Don't go a day without connecting with your Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ and the power of His Holy Spirit. It's that important, folks. It's vital. We can learn to live under the Spirit's power instead of our old nature. We can do that. That process of learning is called spiritual growth, back to sanctification and holy, being set apart, being ministers, part of the royal priesthood of all believers. This process is called spiritual growth. I want you to know we're growing together. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Not necessarily in that order. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. And there's power in that, folks. 
power in those fruits. That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That sounds like Jesus. He's giving you access to all those gifts. And the more your life is shaped by him, the more you'll have those gifts. And they're beautiful gifts. Those are gifts of the Spirit. We don't strive for these traits. They grow in us when the Spirit is in charge. We have a part to play in our growth, but the Holy Spirit is the power. The Holy Spirit is the one that channels the gifts, gives them to us, folks. God's Spirit empowers us to recognize sin. We can't avoid what we don't see. On my car, it's actually my my Tahoe, which is approaching 200,000 miles now. I'm not embarrassed with that. I, I drive all over the place. And uh, I drove my last vehicle to 325,000. Yes, and the transmission fell out. <laughs> Glenn will appreciate it because that was, what was that vehicle, Glenn? You remember what my vehicle was, don't you? Envoy. It was an Envoy, GMC Envoy. Never forget that vehicle. But this vehicle that I have now, I've, I've had it since 2015, and there are still features I haven't figured out on it. It's that kind of vehicle. And so it has this anti-collision alert system on the dashboard. There's a little image there. And I finally learned how to use it. It makes a beeping sound whenever it senses that I'm in danger of hitting something. Of course, it can be a little annoying when it goes off at random moments. Sometimes it forgets that I have a steering wheel and that I can turn the vehicle. But I get the idea. It measures my trajectory and senses whether I'm going to have a problem. You see, the Holy Spirit can be our anti-sin warning device. John 16, 8 says, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, his inner prompt will alert us to where we are on a trajectory to act in a way that's not like Jesus. We might hit the sin barrier. Coming up, unless you turn, you're going to slam into sin. Well, this helps us become more like Jesus. Sometimes we override that signal and we crash in to sin. We do it, folks. We know it's wrong. Oh, it won't matter if I just take one more look, one more swig, one more puff, one more sniff. It won't matter if I add a zero on my taxes here or do that it won't matter just a little bit and God's trying to warn you don't do it don't override me but your sinful nature wants to do it all the time wants to override the goodness of God that's in you but I need to remind you that Jesus defeated Satan I need to remind you that he defeated evil okay it's that inner voice, so to speak, that you confuse with Satan and sometimes Jesus. And that inner voice might just be, could be, probably is your voice. The enemy of your soul many times is you. Not to be blamed on everybody else and even the devil, but it's you. You're making those decisions. You're making those choices. And it's not because Satan told you to do it or God told you to do it. You just decided you're going to do it because you're still leaning into your own flesh. I did it my way. I can do this on my own. I don't need you to tell me how to get there. I don't need help with directions. I don't need you to criticize me or tell me what's wrong or tell me what's right. I know what I need to do. That confidence can lead to arrogance, and arrogance can lead to complacency, and complacency complacency can lead to a very mediocre, lonely, sorrowful life. And many people are walking around today over and over, just in a circle, over and over, with no focus, with no reason, with no life. They're dead, walking zombies. So there are times when we feel guilty, and there's a reason for that. But God wants you to be able to go to bed tonight and every night with no guilt, with no shame, and no confusion. And I believe that can happen, folks. Sometimes we feel guilty when we shouldn't, and other times we are oblivious to our sin. So we need the Holy Spirit 
to give us an accurate read. In the Bible, to give us an objective understanding. You see, God's, in, God's Spirit empowers us to change our behavior. The word for this in the Bible is repent. Now, there's a, a Greek word called metanoia. I taught you this word a few weeks ago. It's a changing of your mind and the way that you think. I'm going to think and act like God because I have access to the Holy Spirit that gives me the mind of Christ to know what His will is. Instead of thinking and acting like the world and becoming like the world, I'm going to become more like Christ. To repent means to change our minds and then change directions, to stop going our way and go God's direction instead. Now, this may seem elementary to you, but I believe we all need to hear this. Transformation into Jesus' image involves both God's power and our willingness. We have to be willing. That's the element of free will. The theological term is free determinalism. He's given me the opportunity to make my own choices and my own decisions. Back to making the decision for the faith. You make that decision personally. You claim the name Christian, Christ follower. Not based on somebody else. Well, they got enough faith for me. I don't need to worry about it myself. Shouldn't worry anyway. The Bible says don't worry. But you should be concerned if you've not made that decision yourself. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is to fully surrender to Jesus Christ. And if you're still confused, still struggling, still hurting every single day, and we're going to have some hurt, we're going to have some pain, but that's how your life is defined, that probably means, most likely means, I think it does mean, I believe it means, you haven't fully surrendered to Jesus Christ and all the benefits of following the wounded healer. You realize he was wounded. You realize he was hurt. But you want to know the difference between him and me and you? Is he had an unoffendable heart. He didn't worry about what everybody else thought. The only concern he has was pleasing his heavenly father. That, folks is having a life shaped like Jesus. You see, this transformation involves both God's power and our willingness. It's like a dance. A dance requires two partners, right? God has a part and we have a part. Our part is to be willing to change. We don't have the power in ourselves, but the Holy Spirit will only enter where He's welcome. He will only enter where he's welcome. He's here at Misty Creek because he's welcome. We call upon the name of Jesus, and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit for us is not an it. The Holy Spirit is real, is a person, is active and alive. And we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit here at Misty Creek. You see, God won't force us to change if we're intent on going our own way. He won't. But that doesn't mean you give up on telling your brother or your sister or that neighbor about Jesus Christ. You keep doing the possible. You keep praying for them, supporting them, inviting them, loving them. You do that. You do the possible, and you trust the Holy Spirit to do the impossible. A.W. Tozer said, God will take nine steps toward us, but he will not take the tenth. He will incline us to repent, but he cannot do our repenting for us. We must repent. If we're going to change step by step, we need to take a step and take an action. Getting into a small group, women rooted in Christ, the men's Bible study, the power hour of prayer, the other groups that happen in the church, the youth group, the creek kids, getting in young adults, we're forming our young adult ministry. Get involved and grow. The Spirit will produce fruit in us as we're growing, as we're becoming holy and sanctified. The best way to overcome the barrier of sin is not to focus on the sin we need to avoid, but on the fruit that we desire. I desire more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I desire those, Lord. Make it so. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5:16. Let me say this, only the God of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, can empower us to live the life of God. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can shape us and transform us into the image of Jesus. So open yourself to Him. 
Ask him to fill you. Do this regularly and daily. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Holy Spirit, fill me. Any place where you sense you're stumbling, ask the Holy Spirit to transform and change you. In fact, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Here's a prayer. We're going to pray this prayer together. Are you ready? Mighty God, you are our provider, our Savior, our Redeemer. We long for you. Our days and weeks drift by. We stumble and we miss your presence. We give ourselves to you and pray for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When you pray a prayer like that, now you have a model of prayer to go by. You don't have to pray that long thing. All you need to do is say, Lord, I pray for your transforming power to enter in me, to make me more like you. May I serve you. May I follow you. May I surrender to you. If you've not made that decision to follow Jesus, I invite you to pray right now and receive Jesus as your Savior. Make the greatest decision you'll ever make. Let's pray. Jesus, I belong to you. I lift up my heart to you. I ask you to enter into my heart and save me, Lord. Forgive me of my sins, my waywardness. Bring new life into me. Make me a new creation, Lord Jesus. And I promise this day forevermore, I will follow you step by step all the days of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want to know. I want Doug to know. I want you to tell your neighbor, somebody around you, even if you don't know anybody yet, your brothers and sisters, I want you to tell them, I received Jesus into my heart today. Or maybe you recommitted today. I want you to go and tell somebody. I don't care who it is. Lolly, I recommitted my life to Jesus today. She will hug you and she'll be so happy you did that. Praise God. We're supposed to shout it from the mountaintops, folks. How are they going to know that we're Christians if we don't shout it and share our love with others? Hallelujah. This last song uh, is a prayer. It's a plea to be more like Jesus, to be changed from the inside out, to be more like him, to be less like me. So if you want that in your own life, let's stand together and sing to him. Pass my 
Um, Stephen talked about uh, sin, forgiveness, sanctification, becoming a little more like Jesus, and holiness. And I wanted to share a glimpse of heaven from Revelation. This is from Revelation 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This one is from Revelation 22. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light from the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And lastly, from Jude, regarding the pathway to paradise, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. We love y'all. Be blessed.